Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Well, he reminds us today that his followers are to be laborers for the kingdom, not just followers of the kingdom, missionary disciples who serve the Lord by extending that kingdom. And Luke's gospel includes a series of expanding mission trips, we might say. Jesus calls some disciples, he begins to train them up, and then he sends them out on these kind of trial runs to do the kinds of things that Jesus was doing, to be his emissaries and co-workers. The twelve had first been sent on a mission trip like that in chapter 9. Now the number 12, as you can see right away, indicates this symbolism is a, about a mission to the Jews. These disciples were to become 12 patriarchs of a new Israel, and so they were sent out to proclaim that kingdom and to heal. And then next, in the same chapter, an unspecified group and number was sent especially to Samaria. Now, they had a tough time because the people were upset that Jesus' face was set toward Jerusalem. That is to say, he probably came off as too Jewish for this crowd. They didn't like it. The Jews were their big rivals in Israelite religion. Now, in chapter 10, another group, or at least a bigger group of disciples, 70, are sent out on a mission trip to proclaim the kingdom and to heal. The number of 12 called to mind the mission to the Jews, while the number 70 symbolized the mission to the Gentiles, although we would wait really until after the Lord's resurrection for the full-fledged mission to the Gentile world. At that time, the Jews reckoned there were about 70 nations in the Gentile world. And the number 70 was also significant because Moses had chosen 70 elders who would assist him in the task of leading the people through the wilderness. 70 was also the number of the Sanhedrin, the governing council. And so he sent them out fully empowered for this ministry. And it was a daunting task. I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Some towns and some people will welcome you with open arms. Others will not. Don't let that discourage you. Just shake the dust off your feet and keep on going. Leave the rest up to the judgment of God. Jesus told them that, as with Moses, a measure of his power would be given to them to equip the 70 for all the tasks they, that they were to perform. They were given authority over the enemy. They were to heal the sick and cast out demons. They were to announce to all who would listen, the kingdom of God has come near to you. He reminded them the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It was a challenge, but the Lord found 70 special men who were up to the challenge of being leaders and missionaries. The harvest for the 70 were thousands in towns in ancient Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. For the church, the harvest is the world, and that almost exceeds imagination. The billions of souls around the world, across time, who are in need of the grace and mercy of God. And each of those billions is an individual with his or her own story to tell, her own hurts and faults, his own scars from sin and personal conflicts, her own wounds from bad choices and lost dreams, his own moral blindness and spiritual darkness. All of them are precious in the eyes of God. He longs to redeem all of them, and Jesus offers salvation to each one of them. The harvest indeed is plentiful, but unfortunately, even with nearly two of the nine billion people on planet Earth today calling themselves Christian, the laborers are, and have always been, too few in number. Jesus, of course, wants each of us, every one of us, to labor with him where we are. And Jesus also asks us to pray the Lord of the harvest for laborers to be sent forth. And it's not just enough to plant seeds of the gospel. We need those who will till the soil and water and fence in and gather in the enormous harvest of God's kingdom. In the case of the 70, their labor was mainly to till the soil. 
to get it ready for Jesus to come and plant the seeds of the gospel, the good news of reconciliation with God by his grace. And breaking up the soil is hard to do. It would involve conflict with evil, calling it by name, announcing God's judgment, and showing the need for God's mercy. The 70 were sent to break up the soil with the gravity of sin and show the need for God's forgiveness. God has a specific task for all of us to play in the work of the kingdom. For some, it will be breaking up the soil. For others, it will be planting seeds and watering them. For others, it will be harvesting the grain. We enter into each other's labor. Each of us are humble workers in the fields, laboring with the Lord to bring about the kingdom of God. In our passage today from Luke's Gospel, Jesus also reminds us that our labor for the kingdom is always rewarded by the Lord of the harvest. The Seventy recognized this right away. They couldn't wait to share the news when they got back about how their labor had been blessed by the Lord of the harvest. You'll never guess what happened out there, they said. We saw people respond to your message about the kingdom. We laid hands on people, and they were actually healed. We saw broken hearts mended. We saw tears of joy. We saw the demons shudder at God's power. Of course, the scriptures tell us we reap what we sow. That applies both to the wages of sin and to the just rewards of kingdom labor. Every apostolate comes with its own rewards. God wants us to recognize the rewards that come through serving him. Rewards give us encouragement and motivate others to join in our service. But Jesus also reminds us that at the end of today's gospel lesson, that the greatest reward is not about sharing in God's power, about doing amazing things. The greatest reward is sharing in God's mercy. Do not rejoice so much that the spirits submit to you, Jesus said, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You might say there are two ways of serving the Lord, good versus bad, right versus wrong. Proudly, they said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus tells them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, why does our blessed Lord bring this up? No one had asked him about the devil's fall. So what do you think he's getting at? Well, I think there are two reasons for this comment, and, and both of them are equally true. First, he's reminding them about the authority that he has given them. Of course the demons were subject to you. What did you expect? I sent you out in my name. I've already seen the victory that I sent you out there to gather up. And second, he's also reminding them not to let it go to their heads. Don't become too sure of yourself. It wasn't about you. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Don't ever forget that the devil was once an angel of light, one of the best of God's creatures, called to serve him in heaven. What happened when he became too sure of himself? became self-absorbed, became prideful. You've seen the lightning flash across the sky. It lights up the world in an instant, and just as quickly it's gone. Well, I saw Satan fall like that. Don't be too sure of yourself. If it can happen to the best angel, it can happen to you. Listen to how Jesus has phrased this calling. It's the same for each of us. You are gentle lambs living among wolves. Your safety comes from the shepherd. Carry nothing with you. Salute no one on the road. You have to learn to depend upon me, Jesus says. You have to learn to be determined and single-minded in service. Stay in the same house. Eat what they provide. That is, do your best where I put you. Don't be on the lookout for a way out and a way up, thinking you know better and can improve on my plan. And as far as the results go, success is not determined by how many are healed or how many are converted or how many reject and ridicule you. Your success is determined by your faithfulness to God's calling. 
Give some thought this week to the way that God has called you to his service. Consider whether you've been humble or prideful in that calling. God has called each of us to be his humble servants. And those are the results that he's looking for. Don't rejoice so much that the spirits submit to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.